Dear God, thank you for this this day to be able to study your word. Um, we ask that you be with Deidre and I and help us to, to learn more about your son, our Savior. In your name we pray. Amen. So we finished last time um, in chapter 2 talking about how we have faith in Jesus. That, that's how we're saved. We're, we're saved through that faith. Um, but saying that we have faith in Jesus, well, we got to make sure we know, you know, who is Jesus? You know, who is he that, that we believe in to be our Savior? And so to start this class, um, Pastor Sharp usually asks this agree or, de agree or disagree question. As long as you know Jesus existed, you will go to heaven. So as long as you know that Jesus lived on the earth, you'll go to heaven. No, I think you have to affirm the belief. All right. So you bring up a good point, right? Yeah. Knowing is different than believing, right? Right. A lot of people will acknowledge, yeah, Jesus was a real guy. Um, there's a lot of just history that attests to that. But a lot of those people still don't believe that Jesus is the Savior, the Son yeah, of God. Exactly. exactly, yeah. And so that's that's what we're going to talk about today. Who is Jesus, our Savior? Why do we trust in him? Um, and so when we talk about Jesus, th th you think of all the different names that, that he had. You know, people call, he called himself the shepherd, shepherd of the sheep, um, wonderful counselor, um, savior, Emmanuel, which means God with us. And with all those names, that they're given to us to tell us something about Jesus. And so we start today by talking about um, one of the most important names that we hear Jesus called. Um, he's called our Savior, the Christ. Um, so that word Christ is the is a Greek word. In Hebrew, it said Messiah. So in the Old Testament, you'll read a lot of it when it talks about the coming Messiah. Mm -hmm. And in the Greek, you know, in the New Testament, they say Christ. And both those words mean the same thing. They mean the anointed one. And so in the Old Testament, there was the practice of anointing people for special positions. So Kings were anointed with, with oil on their head. Um, prophets, God's messengers, priests, those men who worked at the temple as, you know, as serving God and serving the people. Um, it, that anointing set them apart. And you kind of think of that as like someone being knighted. You know, in those like medieval movies, they, they take the sword and that person becomes a knight when they're knighted. Um, and so people knew those were special roles. And God kept telling his people that there's going to be the special anointed one who's going to come, the, the, the one who's going to be the perfect prophet, priest, and king, all three in one. Um, so look forward to that one, that one who's going to be um, the anointed one. And so we know that that was talking about Jesus. And there are three things that in the Bible that show us, yeah, this, this was talking about Jesus. So the first one there says that Jesus was installed by God. So go ahead and read that Acts 10 passage there. You know what has happened? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. Yeah. So that's talking about Jesus. Um, you know, God was anointed, or God anointed Jesus, um, pointing back to what happened at Jesus' baptism. So John the Baptist a messenger from God, the last messenger before Jesus, God had told him, you know, the one that, that you're looking for, this promised Messiah, he's the one that his spirit will descend on. And at Jesus' baptism, when Jesus was baptized, um, that the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove comes down and, uh, and lands on Jesus, showing, okay, yeah, this is the proof that he is the one we're waiting for. God showed that himself. And so not only was, the, you know, God the Father show that, but Jesus revealed that he was the Messiah himself. He, he said, this is me. Um, so that, that first passage there, just a little bit of context on that. Jesus was talking to this woman at, at a well um, in Samaria. And Jesus, being God, knowing all things, knows that she's had multiple husbands, multiple relationships, and not, not in, in the right way. And so he calls her on her sin, and, and the woman just tries to deflect it and says, well, you know, you say I'm doing the wrong thing, but we'll see what, what the Messiah says when he comes. And this is what Jesus, and so this is what Jesus says in reply. Um, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I will speak to you and he. So he very clearly says, you're waiting for the Messiah. Well, that's me. I, I'm claiming that it's me. I will speak to you and he. Mm -hmm. You want to do whatever she wants to do. Saying that, okay, when the Messiah comes, we'll see about it. We're going to say, yeah, this is me. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, the Messiah is here. Like, let's talk about it now, right? Um, and Jesus, you know, anyone could say that. Anyone could say, well, I, I am the Messiah. 
Um, but even on top of that, Jesus points out, he's not only saying this himself, but he says, look at all of the Old Testament. Um, that's what that Luke passage says. Um, Jesus speaking says, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So he's saying, you can read all those prophecies, those things that said, this is what the Messiah will do. And you'll see that it's me. I, I lived all those things. I've said all those things. And that's what the third point is that we have. Jesus per perfectly fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah. Um, Matthew says, he will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus because it will save his people from their sins. Yeah. So that prophecy from Isaiah, the virgin will, will be with child and give birth to a son. Um, yeah, Jesus was the one who was born of a virgin. We, we hear about that. Um, you think about all the different ones. And, you know, we could go on and on talking about, you know, being born in Bethlehem. Um, the prophecy is about being crucified. Um, the, the betrayal that, that, was, that was prophesied. Um, his clothes even being gambled away at the cross. That was prophesied. Um, and so that's what all those were fulfilled by Jesus. And that's why Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the one. Um, the Bible makes it clear. Jesus said it himself. God showed us that, that Jesus is that Messiah. And so now we're going to talk about the two the two natures of, of Jesus. So I'll just kind of say, to, as we start, it's talking about Jesus as God and Jesus as man. And so first I'll talk about Jesus being revealed as true God. And so how do we know that? Well, we know that by the divine names that are given to him. Um, and so we'll just kind of skim, skim those passages at the bottom of the page there. Um, 1 John 5 at the very end says, even in his son, Jesus Christ, he is the true God and eternal life. Uh, yeah, Jesus is true God. That's what that says. Um, do you want to read that Colossians 2 verse 9 passage? For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lies in the body of one. Yeah, so, so that deity, that other word for God, um, all the fullness of God lives in, in bodily form in Jesus. Not partially God, not, you know, it, it's he is full God, is what that passage is saying. And John 1 verse 1, go ahead and read that. And the big one. one was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All right. Yeah. So you keep reading in John chapter one, two, and it makes it clear that the word became flesh. So the word is is a name being used for Jesus here. So in the beginning, Jesus was there. Um Jesus was with God and in fact the word Jesus was God. He another testament saying, yeah, he's called God. Yeah. And that last one, first Corinthians two eight, go ahead and read that one. The rulers of this age understood it. Or if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. Yeah. So that, that last title, too, um, the Lord of glory, um, a name, a title that clearly refers to, to God as Lord of all things. And once again, saying they crucify the Lord of glory. And who was crucified? Well, Jesus was. Jesus is the Lord of glory. So a lot of names. A lot of names. Yeah, a lot of names. And like I said, we could list a whole bunch, too, and keep going. Um so that, that's the first way we see Jesus is, Jesus is God, by the names that, that he's called. And we also see it by, by his attributes or his characteristics. And so a lot of these that we're going to, you know, there's four here, but you'll notice these are the same ones that God brought up when we talked about who God is in chapter one. Um, and because Jesus is God, of course, he has those same characteristics. So the first one, um, he's unchangeable. Go ahead and read Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Um, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. All right. He's unchangeable just like God is unchangeable because he's God. Um, number two, he's omnipresent. That means he's He's everywhere. He's always present in all places. Matthew 28. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. All right. Jesus made that promise to his disciples before he ascended. Um, saying, I, I will always be with you guys. Even though you may not physically see me, I'm still going to be there. Um, he's also omniscient. He knows everything, John 21. The third time he said to him, Simon, John, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. All right. Mm -hmm. So so Peter acknowledges it. Yeah, Jesus, you know all things. Um, 
it's just very clearly. And of course, Jesus doesn't say, oh, no, no, don't say that. That's wrong. Yeah. Um, he says, yeah, you're, you're right. Yeah. And so I know all things. And, and Peter, I'm appointing you to go be a leader of, of the church. Um, and so, yeah, he knows all things, too. And another divine attribute, that omnipotency. He's, he's all powerful. Matthew 28. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All right. So Jesus speaking again, right? Um, all authority has been given to me. Um, no one on earth can claim to have all the power in the world. That's only God's to have. And Jesus is saying, yeah, um, that, that, is, that is my power because I am God. Yeah, all right. And so then, um, yeah, so we got the divine names, the divine attributes, those characteristics, and through what Jesus does, those divine deeds, we also see that, that he is God. Um, and so, first of all, in creation, God created the world, that, that as we'll talk about later. Um, but we know that Jesus also created the world as a God. Go ahead and read that John passage. During all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. All right. So, we, we read the, the verse, John 1, 1, saying, in the beginning was the word, right? And this is a continuation of it. Yeah. Right. And this is a continuation now saying, through him, Jesus, that word, all things were made. Um, yeah. Only God can make the world. Jesus, and this is saying, yeah, Jesus was there to do it. Um, number two, miracles. And there's a blank behind it. Um, you can think of any of the miracles Jesus did, right? Um, you know, I guess, can you, can you think of any off the top of your head that stick out to you? Miracles, Jesus, um, let it, what's his name, walk again, the blind. Well, I mean, yeah, it, which, which one do you want to pick, right? He, he did a lot, right? He, yeah. he healed a lot of a lot of blind to be able to see, yep. the crippled to be able to walk. Right. I don't remember the bad story, but the name is in my head. Yeah, I can't yeah, see it. Um, I don't remember. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, two two types of miracles that Jesus did a lot for a lot of people. Yeah. Heal blindness, um, made people walk. Um, the first miracle he did, he turned that water into wine at the wedding, um, raised multiple people from the dead. The fish and bread to feed the whole right, that people. Crazy to think about, you know, five so loaves of bread. Be, so that they can get to it's not a miracle. Yeah. Yeah, we could, you know, we could go for an hour talking about all the miracles, right? There's, there's, cause there's so many he did, right? And, you know, Jesus can make someone that was blind see. I can't walk up to someone and say, oh, um, you know, have sight. I don't have that power to do that. No no person has power to do that. That power only comes from God. So that's the self-explanatory miracles. Point. Exactly, yeah. It just, it shows itself. It's more proof. Yeah, this is, this is God. Um, and number three, through the forgiveness of sins. This is one that gets kind of overlooked sometimes because compared to those miracles, those are things you can see. Um, big displays of power, right? Forgiveness of sins, that's not something you see. It's just something that, that Jesus says that it is. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of summarize a big portion of that, that Mark passage there. Um, so Jesus was teaching in a house, and the house was completely packed with people. And some, some men brought their friend who was paralyzed. So one of these stories, he's paralyzed, he couldn't walk. But they can't get in the house because it's so packed. And so they go up on the roof of the house and they decide, you know what we're going to do? We're going to dig through the roof so we can lower our friend down to Jesus. And so that's exactly what they do. And they lower this man down. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, what, what should Jesus say? You know, get up and walk. Um, but that's not the first thing he says. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. Which is, as we're going to see, that's, that's even more amazing than making someone walk. And when Jesus says that, there are some of the teachers, the religious teachers of, of Israel there. And they start thinking to themselves, who is this guy who claims to have the power to forgive sins? That's only something God can do. And Jesus, being God, knows what they're thinking. And, and he says this to them. So I'm going to start reading at verse 9 there, in the bottom of, in the middle of that second paragraph. Um, Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he makes this point. You guys doubt that I have the power to forgive sins. And so I'm going to heal this man to show you I do have that power. And so that's exactly what he does. He tells the paralytic, get up, take your mat, and go home. Um, and, and that's what he does. He's healed, right? 
And so Jesus shows by by doing that miracle, it, that's proof that what I said he about forgiving your sins. Exactly. I do have had authority to forgive your sins too. And so, yeah, Jesus is God shown by those names, attributes, and his deeds. Any questions so far? Hmm. All right. We'll keep rolling then. And so that's the first person, Jesus is God, or the first nature, I should say. But the second nature that Jesus also has is, is true man. He's both of them. And so in a lot shorter section on this, but we see some of the similar things. Um, human names, human attributes, human deeds. Um, go ahead and read that first Timothy passage at the top there. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. All right. So um, I don't think it gets any more clear than that. Um, the man Christ Jesus, right? It, it's saying he's a man. Um, Luke 24. Go ahead and read that one. Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see my hands. So Jesus, after his resurrection, appears to the disciples and he tells them, you know, I'm not I'm some spirit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like he's like, you know, touch me, you know. He's got flesh and blood and bones, just like you and I have have flesh and bones, and every other person. Just does. Delete, he's like, yeah, <laughs> take it out. Yeah, you can check it for yourself, right? Um, and, and Jesus, he has human feelings. That that passage says he's he was overwhelmed with sorrow. Um, that's a human thing to feel. Right. And in Hebrews four fifteen, it's a very human thing to be tempted. Um, go ahead and read that passage. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet was without sin. Yeah. So he was tempted in every way, um, just as you and I are as, as humans. Um, mm -hmm. The difference, of course, being Jesus didn't follow those did. temptations. Um, yet without sin. Yeah, exactly, without sin, like it says. Mm -hmm. um, and the last two, just, just other points saying Jesus felt human things like we do. Um, Mark says Jesus was hungry. Um, that's a human thing. John 4, Jesus got tired from his journey. Um, I get tired when I do a lot of work in the day or, you know, do a long walk or run somewhere. I got that big thing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Jesus is shown to be a true man as well. And so we, we get that question there. What two things does scripture show us about, about Jesus? He's true God. He's true man. Yes, true feelings and everything that living human being has. Exactly, yeah. And saying that Jesus is true God and true man, um, when, you, when we hear that, we think, that doesn't make sense. How can, how can you be both? Um, that's something we're not exactly able to that's explain. Um, um, as, as humans, you know, we're, we're limited in our knowledge. We don't know everything. Um, it's one of those things like um, when we talked about with the Trinity in chapter one, three persons, one God, we can't explain it. It's, it's a faith thing. S similar here we can't explain what that how that all works together but by faith we say you know god give me the faith to believe it because that's what you show us in your word jesus is true god jesus is true man he's both of those all right so then we have a couple questions there and before you look at at the answers that are below them just i want you to think about it first so that first question why did jesus have to be true man he's resurrected so for him to be true man he has to be able to have the same, I guess, feelings as regular people. Okay. So, so yeah, he's got to be the same as regular people, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because who did Jesus come to earth to save? Um, he came to save us, right? So he needs to be one of us to, to take our place, to, to save us. And so, yeah, let's look at those, those points there then. So first of all, to become our substitute. Um, as a person, a person needs to pay the price. Um, we couldn't do it, so he took our place as a human. Also, to live a perfect life. Um, the requirement for us to get to heaven is perfection. None of us can do it. Um, but Jesus lived that perfect life as a man when we could in our place. Right. And, and finally, also, not only to be perfect, but to pay for our sins. God demanded a payment for the sins of the world. Um, and so the guilt of our sin demands death. Um, Romans 3.23 says the wages of sin is death. Um, and so Jesus needed to be a true man to die in our place. God is, is eternal, unchangeable. God doesn't die. Um, a man, on the other hand, man does die. 
So Jesus needed to be man so that he could die for us. Mm -hmm. So Galatians 4, go ahead and read that. But when the times had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Right. So God sent his son, um, born under law, to redeem those under law. Um, in order to save us, as people who live under the law, Jesus needed to be a man who was also under the law, to save us from that. Mm -hmm. In Hebrews 2.14, go ahead and read that. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. Right. So we're all destined for for death, right? That, that's what we're stuck with because of our sin. Um, and so there needed to be death. Um, and someone needed to destroy the one who had that power of death. And, and that meant as people of flesh and blood, that's our punishment. So someone with flesh and blood, um, a man needed to save us from that punishment. That accepts Jesus. All right. So then we have that second question there. And, and just want you to think about that one too. Why did Jesus need to be true God, though? He needs to be true God because he needs the one that has supremacy and power over what we we have limitations to. Mm -hmm. so he yeah. needs to be true God to pay for our sins, I guess. Exactly, to pay for, for the sins of the world, right? Mm -hmm. And in the hypothetical situation, of course, no one can be perfect. But if there was someone born on earth today who, who was the perfect child and, and they were able to live an entirely perfect life somehow um, and they died and they could say, well, I was perfect, so I get to go to heaven. Their life still wouldn't count for anyone else because they're a person. They're a man. They don't have the power to say that. Um, of course, that's a hypothetical. No one can be perfect. Um, but God, but Jesus, being God, could, first of all, be perfect. And on top of that, his perfection, like you said, it could count for all sins. Um, because God has that power. All right, so let's yeah, let's look at those then. Um, so number one, fulfillment of the law would be sufficient for all people, just like you said. It, mm -hmm. it wasn't just for him; it was for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, number two, so that his life and death would pay the ransom for sin. Um, yeah. We needed that perfect, perfect payment. That's what he was. And number three, so that he could conquer death and the devil on our behalf. We can try all we can to avoid death and to live as long as we can, but eventually it comes for all people. We try as hard as we can to resist the devil, to, to not follow his ways into sin, but we still mess up every day. Mm -hmm. So that's what a man would do, but God, he has the power to defeat those things. Um, so let's mm -hmm. go ahead and read that first Corinthians passage there. Okay. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So where, where, O oh death, is your sting? You know, we get to say this because Jesus has defeated death. And you know, just thinking of that picture of of the sting of death. Um, so when a bee stings you, it, it it tries to fly away, right? But the stinger sticks it, and it pulls itself apart, and the bee dies. That's what happens. So it, it's it's sad, right? It, yeah. um, but in this picture, it's a good thing for us because you think of it, when, when Jesus was on the cross, death put its stinger in Jesus. But just like that bee flies away and dies, death doesn't have power over us now that it's stung Jesus. Because Jesus Jesus took that sting for us. Um, just like that bee... <laughs> kind of bugging me, sorry about that. <laughs> um, but, but just like but Jesus, you know, he took that sting of death for us. And so just like that bee can fly around a little bit, but it can't bother us anymore. Um, death, it's still going to, you know, we're still going to die, but it doesn't have the final say anymore because Jesus took that full power of death and he destroyed it. Um, he died in our place to defeat death, pay, pay that price for our sins so that we no longer have to be afraid. And then we also have the life of the dead. So I guess death is not that really at the hand. So we still have the, we have to go to heaven and live that life to save the world. Exactly, yeah. Death is, is, isn't the end for us, right? It's mm -hmm. it's just, you know, you could say now it's a step on the way to heaven, right? Yeah. It, the door to the door to paradise is open. In other way, the Bible talks about Jesus dying for us. He's opened that gate to heaven for us now. Um, so we, we finished this, this section talking about, well, what would Jesus have accomplished for us if he was only a man or only God? Um, 
would he, so I guess I'll ask, ask the question this way. If Jesus was the only man, could he save save all people? It would have limitations. So it would just be just like us where all mind just stopped at certain stages. We can, you know, do miracles and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. So, so yeah, the answer got to be no, right? Jesus would have limits as a human. Yeah. All right. Now, if Jesus was only God, could he still die for the sins of all people? Well, not really, but if it was still God, he wouldn't be able to be on our be on the level of human to be able to, I guess, sympathize and feel exactly how we feel as human beings. All right, yeah, it, it's a great point. You know, if he was only God, he couldn't come down to our level and and you know not only just to feel what we feel, but to be our substitute. Um, right. You know. If, if you're playing, if there's a soccer game going on and there needs to be a substitute on the field, you can't put a zebra into the game, right? Yeah, that's that, always that's that work. Animals can substitute for us because they're not, you know, you won't be so it's kind of like a sin. Exactly, yeah. If, if Jesus was just God, he can't substitute for us humans. Um, so that, that last question just drives home the point for us. You know, some people say Jesus was just God. Some people say Jesus was just a man. Um, well, we, we can't say that. Because the Bible says he's both, and if, if he needed to be both in order to save us. And yeah, the needed to be a man to die, needed to be God to be perfect, and to make that payment pay for all people. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the two natures of Jesus, true God, true man. Any questions through that? Okay. Well, then, those, so then the second half of chapter three, still talking about Jesus, of course, and now it talks about his two states of existence. Um, and so the two states being his hum humiliation and his exaltation. And so we start with the humiliation of Jesus. And so when we speak of Jesus' humiliation, we're referring to the time when Jesus um, set aside the full use of his divine powers. So talking from his conception to his death. Um, you know, humiliation, that word usually associates with it, like being embarrassed, um, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about what, what you know, is right there. Jesus setting aside those full use of divine powers. Um, what's important when we start talking about this is to remember that this didn't mean that Jesus was not God anymore. Jesus was always God. And so he always had the power of God. But he chose to not make that full use while on earth. And so kind of picture it like this. If you're playing basketball with, 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 your, with Chrissy, you know, or if you're playing any game with Chrissy and she says, well, she, I want it to be fair. Um, or she says, I want you to try it, try as hard as you can. But you know, as an adult, if you try your hardest, you're going to beat her by a ton, whatever game you're playing, right? And so you might do something to limit yourself. You know, maybe you you put your right hand behind your back, you're right-handed, and only use your left hand to, to kind of even the playing field, right? You wouldn't say that you lost your right arm. You still have the use of it, right? You just um, substitute me on her level as a four-year-old. Yeah, yeah, trying to trying to be on her level, and so you're you're limiting yourself. Not of, of course you don't cut your arm off; you still have it, but you're just choosing not not to use it for for her sake, right? And so Jesus, he always had the power as God because he is God, but Jesus chose to not always make that full use of that. And when we hear about Jesus doing miracles on earth, we get glimpses of that of that power during his time on earth. Um, and what's important when we when we you see those glimpses, it was always for the benefit of others too. So Jesus wouldn't even use that power for his own benefit, but but to bring others to faith and to help them. And so all throughout Jesus' life, we see how he he put aside that use of his power. Um, so so we get a nice summary of this too in what's called the Apostles' Creed. Um, so this this statement of belief from the apostles. And so if you jump to the next page, that's kind of where it gets brought up, but we'll go through that first and then jump back over. So um, the middle of page 17 there. Um, the Apostles' Creed, it, it's a summary of what those apostles taught and, and believed. Um, you know, they saw Jesus with their own eyes, and so they, they came up with this summary to say, this is who, who God is, who Jesus is. And it summarizes our beliefs too, because this creed is based on what they saw and based on God's word. Um, and it's also based on the Trinity. So there's three different parts to it. First part talks about God the Father. Second part, God the Son, Jesus. And the third part talks about the Holy Spirit. 
Um, and so that second article is a brief history of Jesus' humiliation and exaltation. So that, that second paragraph, um, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. So Jesus' birth um, was a step in that, that humiliation, that not making the full use of his power. Um, so true God allowed himself to become a clump of cells in, in, a, in a virgin's womb. Not very glorious. Um, Jesus could have entered earth in a lot more glorious ways too, but he chose to enter by being born. Um, and not even to a king or someone with great wealth, but to this, this normal poor family, um, to, to the Virgin Mary. And you think of it, Jesus, God, was the, the creator of all things. He held, holds the whole world in his hands, but he lowers himself to need his head cradled by, by this teenage woman. Um, so yeah, for, first step there, incredible that he puts all that power aside, allows that to happen to himself, to be one of us. Um, so then continuing on. Um, so then it says, suffered under Pontius Pilate. And so the, the Apostles' Creed jumps 33 years of Jesus' life. And so we kind of go back to the other page now and see, you know, what, what does that all jump over? Well, first of all, it jumps over Jesus' youth. Um, so go ahead and read that, that second Luke passage there, Luke 2.52. Okay, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. Mm -hmm. Stature, yes. And in favor with God and men. All right. Yes, in favor with us. He, he chose to be born as a baby and stay the same life development as our children. Exactly, yeah. You brought that up. Life development, right? Um, you know, Chrissy has clearly grown up in four years, right? Um, Jesus was a baby, and that meant, like any baby, he had to grow up too. Um, and so he, he grew. That meant he had to learn things, he learn how to walk, learn how to talk, um, learn how to, to provide for himself. Um, and physically, he grew up too, to be an adult. Um, and wisdom, yeah, he had, he had to grow in his learning too. Um, all things that Jesus didn't need to do, but he chose to do, to be a, to be our substitute. Um, Jesus' baptism, too. Um, that, that Mark passage there is just saying what, what happened. He was baptized, um, and um, but baptism, as we're going to talk about in chapter 7, it's done for the forgiveness of sins. And so we might think to ourselves, okay, if baptism's for the forgiveness of sins, then why was Jesus baptized? Because Jesus, as God, was perfect, right? Right. Um, so he didn't need baptism, right? Okay. But to be our substitute, he, he allowed himself to be baptized so that he could show us, I'm Wait. stepping in for you. This is what you did for. Exactly, yeah. So and he, he sets the example, and even more than just setting the example, he's showing you, um, by my example, I'm actually taking your place. Uh, I'm substituting for you. I'm doing everything that is required for you, but I'm doing it perfectly, including being baptized there. Mm -hmm. And then after his baptism, a lot of what the Gospels talk about is Jesus' three-year ministry. All the teaching he did, all the preaching. Um, and throughout that ministry, um, we hear about the, the, some of the problems Jesus ran into. Um, not everyone listened to him. Um, and a lot of times, people didn't like him. And in one city, they tried to throw him off the edge of a cliff. And he miraculously walks through the, the crowd. You think about all of the cities that rejected him or said, you know, even his hometown, they said, this is Jesus, who we saw grow up. It, he's, he's the carpenter's son. Is, can he really be who he says he is? Right. Um, people didn't always believe him. And Jesus could have very easily went, well, you know what? You don't believe me? That, you know, you're dead now. This is your punishment. But he didn't do that. He, did, he allowed himself to be ridiculed, to be made fun of, um, so that he could follow through with the plan to save, save those people, even the ones that mocked him. Um, and so then we get to, to Jesus suffering under Pontius Pilate. Um, mm -hmm. So he suffers. Mark 10, 33 at the bottom of that page. Go ahead and read that. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. All right. So as Jesus was going to Jerusalem, he knew what was going to happen. Um, and he tells the disciples, this is what's waiting for me. Um, they're going to betray me, hand me over, spit on me, flog me. Um, 
He could have stopped if he wanted to, right? Still sacrifice over there for us. Yeah. He still said, I'm I'm gonna go through with it though for, for you guys. I'm not gonna stop it, even though I have the power to stop it. And finally, that, that leads to after that suffering, his death, he dies on the cross. Um, Luke 23, 33. Go ahead and read that. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. All right. So even his death was a humiliating thing. He could have, you know, dying in your sleep is, is peaceful, it's nice. Um, but Jesus was crucified. Uh, a way of death that was designed to be extra humiliating, publicly shaming you, and on top of that, crucified with criminals, um, people who did rightfully deserve it. When Jesus did not deserve it, he was put up between them. Mm -hmm. And yeah, go ahead and read that John passage there. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, "It is finished." With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. All right, so. Jesus says on the cross, it is finished. His work had been completed. He lived the perfect life. He died the perfect death to, to be our substitute. And so that signals the end of, of that humiliation, that putting aside the full use of his divine power um, because he finished the work he came to do. And we're going to see, as we're going to talk about in a second, with the exaltation, now that he dies, he, he rises from the dead, he resumes that full use of his divine power. Um, but before we get to that, we, we close this section with, with a question. Um, so Jesus lived that perfect life of obedience to the Heavenly Father. Um, for 33 years, he was sinless. Um, and how does that perfect life of Christ benefit us? Just before we read that passage, um, how would you ask that question? How does the perfect life of Christ benefit us? That we'll be able to, after death, have our spirit. What is it? Give up his spirit? That's the only part that we really don't know what really happens after that. So I would say that that's the answer to that question. Okay, yeah, it, it punches our ticket for heaven, right? Um, yeah. Um, and, and and so a lot of people, you know, we hear that question and think about it. Well, Christ's perfect life was done so that I could follow, um, which is true. It's a good thing for us to follow Jesus' life, right? Mm -hmm. But you're getting at what's what's even more important than being an example is that. He, he was what we couldn't do, and he gave us that, um, that idea of crediting it to us now. Our lives are not perfect, but Jesus gives us his perfect life so that we can say, yeah, I do get to go to heaven. I can have confidence in that. Um, yeah. yeah. And also, all of these points right here, his suffering, his ministry, his baptism, those are his way of showing man how to follow his steps before we get to, you know, death. Yeah, so so he shows us shows us his steps and and yeah even more important than just showing us and we're, we we love to follow Jesus steps right um, but even more than that we know we're gonna mess up those steps on the way right um, and so that's why Jesus did it perfectly for us so that we could say Jesus life is credited to me now so when God looks at me he doesn't see my sinful life he sees Jesus perfect life and that's why we get to say yeah Jesus has given me that life after death now because he gave me his his perfect life. Um, yeah, so that Romans 5 passage, go ahead and read that there. For just as though the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so all, also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. All right. So the disobedience of one man, talking about Adam in the Garden of Eden, that, that very first sin, through that we were also made sinners. But through the obedience of one man, Jesus, through, through his perfect life, we are made righteous. So yeah, his life given to us makes us righteous before God. All right, so now flipping to the other side, um, the, the second state of Jesus' existence, that exaltation now, um, resuming the full use of his divine powers. And that started at the resurrection and it continues today. Um, and it will continue for all time into eternity. And so we looked at the Apostles' Creed there. Um, and the Apostles' Creed keeps going, talking about the, the um, exaltation of Jesus. Um, so, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, and was buried. End of the humiliation. The next sentence starts the exaltation then. He descended into hell. So, hearing that first part, he descended into hell, how is that, how is that a good thing for Jesus, right? How is that a demonstration of power? Um, well, we need to talk about why did Jesus descend into hell? Some people will say, well, 
he must have descended into hell to suffer. It's still part of that. Um, but as Jesus said on the cross, he said, it is finished. Um, he, the price was paid. He didn't need to pay to suffer anymore. Um, so God's word clearly shows us it couldn't have been to suffer more. So go ahead and read um, Matthew 27 there. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. So, uh -huh. so hell, the definition of hell is separation from God. Um, mm -hmm. And so Jesus was already suffering separation on the cross by, by his words. He says, this is what I'm suffering. I'm suffering separation from God. Um, and so he didn't need to suffer anymore because he already suffered that. Um, John 19, we read that one earlier, Jesus saying, it is finished. He didn't need to suffer anymore after his death. And so those two passages show us, okay, he didn't go down to hell to suffer anymore. He already suffered. So the question is still there. Why did he go down then? Yeah. Um, some people will say, well, if it wasn't to suffer, it was to, to bring some people who were already in hell and to, and to bring them to heaven. Um, but Jesus, but God's word says, once a man dies, he, he's judged. And when he's judged, that's the final decision. And so we see it really wasn't even to do that, but Jesus showing his power, went down to hell to proclaim his victory um, to pretty much show people, you guys are wrong. Um, I was right. Um, you, you didn't believe in me. I'm showing you that I was right. And so we get that, that, that there's only really one passage that speaks clearly to this, and that's that First Peter 1. And I'll read that there and, and kind of break it down. Um, so First Peter 3. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. So, first of all, the, the spirits in prison that he's preaching to. Later on in that chapter in 1 Peter 3, he makes it clear. It's, it's those who disobey, those who rebel. So the people who did not believe in God, rebelled against him, went to hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and Jesus went to preach to them, it says. And this is where people will say, oh, he must have preached good news to them. Um, well, it's interesting in the Greek is that where we only have one word in English to say preached, there are two words in Greek to describe that action. So one word, oiangalizo, it literally means good news. Um, that's not the Greek word that's used here to talk about to talk about preaching. Um, the one that is used is keruso, which is just a general word meaning to proclaim something. You know, you think about a messenger from the king who proclaims a message. Could be bad, could be good. Um, it just means he proclaimed. And so what was he proclaiming down there? And we pull up another passage, Colossians 2.15, which, which isn't listed here. Um, but that passage tells us, you know, having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them. Um, it, it was like a victory parade, pretty much. Uh, for the Romans, when they would defeat a, a, another nation, they would march down the main street with all of the, the captives from their, that nation behind them, all the leaders showing them, look, you guys don't have power over us because even your most powerful people, they couldn't stop us. Um, and it was a way to demoralize them, to really crush their spirits. Um, and so that's the word that's used of Jesus making his public spectacle in hell. It's like he's marching down main street hell saying, look, I was more powerful. I was right. I did defeat the devil. Um, and you guys, as my enemies, rejected me, but I am victorious. All right. Does that does that make sense there with, with that, his descent into hell? Yeah. It's so, it's so like, why did he do that? Yeah. It's it's one of those things where yeah, it's we don't have a lot to, to go off of. We don't we can't say much, but yeah, taking what we can from God's word, we see, yeah. We know it wasn't to suffer. We know it wasn't to, to free people because they were rightfully in hell for their unbelief. Um, yeah, that he was proclaiming to them, proclaiming his victory. Um, and so that's why it's part of his exaltation. It's his power showing, I have resumed my full use of powers, and I'm showing you, yeah, I was victorious. I didn't say that. Yeah. I, I, I am victorious. You guys were in the wrong for, for rejecting me. All right. my last yeah, yeah, it's showing, yeah, it's proof. Um, so then we get to the resurrection on and talking about Easter. So he rises from the dead, this really high point, right? That it's, it's the, the biggest celebration we have at church throughout the year. Um, he didn't stay dead. And so 
first of all, before we even look at those points there, why is Jesus rising from the dead so important? Rising from the dead is important because I guess Holy Spirit shows power. Shows. All right, Show, shows his power, right? Mm -hmm. um, if he wasn't all powerful, he'd stay dead, right? He wouldn't have he rose mm -hmm. from the dead. But he shows, no, I, I am who I said I was. I do have this power, and I am alive again. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Um, so, what does the resurrection prove? And that's the first point that gets brought up there. Um, it guarantees that Jesus is the Almighty Son of God. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead and read that Romans passage there. Romans 1 verse 4. And who though the spirit of holiness who declared with power of the power to be the, God, the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. All right. Yeah, so so it shows. Okay. <laughs> he was Jesus Christ, as he claimed, the powerful Messiah. He declared um, with the power to be now the Son of God. Exactly. But we're in the money, yeah. Um, it also shows us that not only was he powerful, but that that sacrifice was accepted. Um, you know, Romans 5, he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Um, it shows that, yeah, the price was paid. If Jesus had stayed dead, something would have been wrong. Um, maybe he wasn't perfect enough or he wasn't powerful enough. But because he clearly was, he did rise, giving that proof it was accepted on our behalf. Um, and, and the last point, too, for that, it guarantees that we will rise physically from the dead ourselves. Um, John 14, verse 19, go ahead and read that one. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. All right. Because Jesus lives, we will live, too. Um, yeah. Awesome assurance we get from Jesus' resurrection. Yeah. And so after Jesus is, is risen from the dead, um, there's 40 days between that resurrection and his ascension into heaven. Um, and during that time, Jesus prepared his disciples um, by telling them what would happen, what they needed to do. And Jesus also commissioned the disciples. He gave them a, a, a job. Matthew 28, go ahead and read that one. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. All right. So Jesus saying, yep, I have all authority. You read that passage earlier. Mm -hmm. And he says, with that authority, I'm giving you guys a job now um, to go out Preach, preach about me and every everything that I taught you. Um, baptize those people in, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yeah, teach them. Teach them what I taught you. Um, so he gives them that job. And Jesus also promised that he would send the Holy Spirit to strengthen them. Um, so that would happen after Jesus ascended the, the day of Pentecost. We, we are going to celebrate that this Sunday, actually. Um, and it's it's saying, Jesus said, the Spirit's going. I'm going to send the Spirit. He's going to give you power um, to, to preach this message. Um, and that's exactly what happened that day. The Holy Spirit came. They, they had the tongues of fire above their head. They hear the, the whirlwind, um, the sound of the yeah, rushing wind. And that gift was given to them. They received that power to be Jesus' witnesses. And so then after those 40 days, Jesus did ascend to heaven. Um, he ascended to, the, to God's right hand to rule. Um, you know, that, that Acts passage there is just saying what happens. Jesus is talking to the disciples, and, and all of a sudden, he just rises up into the sky, covered by a cloud. And they're just standing there like, what just happened? Um, and two angels appear and tell them, you know, why are you guys standing here? Um, Jesus will come back in the same way. Um, kind of a reminder, kind of a you know, kick in the butt. You know, go and do the mission God has given you to do now. Because Jesus is now ruling at the right hand of God. And so... Then we ask the question, okay, if he's, you know, ruling, um, what does that mean for us now? So first of all, it means that he's not, you know, just sitting up in heaven doing nothing. He's still here among us and very active in our lives. Um, so first of all, he is the head of the church, so he's ruling our lives. Um, go ahead and read that Ephesians 1 passage there. The power of God, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly lands. Far above all rule and of authority, power and dominion, dominion, and every title that can be given, 
not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Right. So he was raised and seated at the right hand. You know, you think of a right hand man, they've got all the power, right? That 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 the, that the ruler has. Um, that is what Jesus has now. He's resumed that full use of power. He's ruling with it. And this passage also tells us the, the why. You know, why is he ruling? What is he doing with it? Um, he's the head over everything for the church. So he's using that power now to watch over his people, um, to take care of us, to bless us, to, to be with us. Um, and one way he does that is by giving people to work for the church. Ephesians 4. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and preachers, to prepare God's people for work of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up. Yeah. So he gives all these people, pastors, teachers, um, to equip his, his church, to build them up in faith. And Jesus also continues to plead our case before the Father. Um, First John 2, go ahead. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. All right. So in Romans 8, just, just you know, says that it, it's like Jesus, or it's not like Jesus is interceding with us. Um, so Jesus is there before God saying, you know, hey, don't look at their sin. I have forgiven it. Um, and so we get to pray to God, thanking him and, and ask him to continue interceding for us. Um, you know, it never talks about Mary or the saints being the ones to intercede with us before God, but it's Jesus. And really, who would you rather have? You know, Jesus, the Almighty Son of God, our Savior, or a person interceding? Um, I'd rather have Jesus, the Almighty Savior, who paid for my sins, to be the one who is doing that interceding. And that's exactly what he does. He continually is there saying, I paid for that, that, that person too. And finally, um, Jesus is preparing a place for us, John 14. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I am going there to prepare a place for you. All right. So that's an awesome comfort for us, right? So he's getting ready for me, right? Yeah. As the bell will be here. Yeah. Prepare room for you there was. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that is talking about humiliation, exaltation, um, put aside full use of his power, resume full use of his power. Any questions, you have? No. Okay. And so then the last thing in this chapter, this is the last page here, talks about the value of Jesus' death for us now. Um, that little picture at the bottom of that page called God's Great Exchange, that idea that Jesus took my sin and, and paid for it on the cross, and in exchange, he gives me his righteousness. Um, mm -hmm. So that when God looks at me, he sees Jesus' righteousness instead like of my filter. sin. I'll take all your mess, like a coffee filter, and I'll give you just the the good stuff. There you go. Yeah, yeah. It takes all the bad stuff, gives us the, the, the great stuff, the perfect stuff. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, yeah, that's what his death accomplished. His death was a payment for sin. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we read some of these, just just kind of skim through them. Um, so that first John passage, the reason God, that Son of God appeared, was to destroy the devil's work. Um, the devil's work was sin, and sin leads to death. Jesus destroyed that though, so that we don't have to be afraid of death anymore. Mm -hmm. um, Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Um, the law says if you don't meet God's standard, you're, you should go to hell. That's what we were under. But Jesus came under that punishment. You know, he lived under the law perfectly so that he could remove that curse from us. Um, Matthew 27, um, that's the one where it said, you know, Jesus said, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, he experienced that punishment, that hell in our place. Um, 2 Corinthians 5. Go ahead and read that one. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Yep. That, and that passage where, you know, a great exchange idea comes from. Um, he took our sin so that we could become his righteousness. Um, and Isaiah 53 says, mm -hmm. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace and was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Yeah. You notice the, what he did for us. Um, he was punished for me. He was crushed for my sin. Um, the punishment that I deserved was on him. He brought me peace. Um, mm -hmm. 
everything he did. And John 3 16, go ahead. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that we so believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Yeah, that's what that was one of my favorite child scriptures. Yep. Yeah. It's just a it's just such a nice, simple, clear passage, right? Jesus died for me. Um, so I could have eternal life and awesome comfort. Yes. And I guess, yeah, that kind of brings us to the next point then too. Um, well, for whom did Christ die? Um, we just read that John 3 passage, it's repeated there. Um, it says you know, for who? Who did? Who does it say? It's for the world, right? You know, yeah, God's so love the world. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what Second Corinthians repeats too. And some people will say, okay, yeah, he means the world, but he means the world of believers. Everyone who only believes in him. No, um, it did it for everyone, non-believers. You know. Exactly, yeah. So that, that's exactly what First John 2 verse 2 says right there. You want to read that one? He is the anointing sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Exactly, yeah. yeah. John writing to believers, he makes it very clear, you know, he did die for our sins, but not just for you and me. Like you said, everyone. He paid for all those sins. Um, and he's that atoning sacrifice, it says. Um, mm -hmm. That idea of atoning means to make at one. So our sins separate us from God. Mm -hmm. uh, but through Jesus... He bridges that gap between God and us, and I'm saying he can be at one again. Yeah. He, he came down to our level, but at the same time, he's not, you know, like man in that sense where he's going to be like, I'm only doing it for you because you're serving me. He's limitless, and he's going to do it for everyone. Yeah, he, he did it for everyone. But um, that brings up, you know, keep going down this rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. But we know that God's word says not all people go to heaven, that there is hell. Um, and so the question needs to be asked well, why? So if Jesus paid for all people, why don't all people go to heaven? Um, and that comes down to the fact that some people reject the payment that, that Christ made for them. Go ahead and read that Mark 16. Passage. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. All right. So those who go to hell are the ones that are condemned. Exactly. They, they are the ones that didn't believe it. They, they didn't say Jesus is their Savior. They, they may have heard it in their lives, but they, they rejected it. Um, you know, Pastor Sharp uses this picture, which kind of blew my mind the first time I heard it, and it helped to helps me picture it. Um, so imagine you're going to a movie, um, and you're walking in from the parking lot at the movie theater, and there's someone standing outside saying, "Free tickets, free tickets, take your free movie ticket." Um, and he hands you one, and you, you're thinking to yourself, "Ah, this has got to be a big scam. Um, no way, I don't believe it. Rip it up, throw it away." Uh, but then you get up to the ticket desk and you ask for one one ticket to you know whatever movie they are right now, and they say okay it's going to be twenty bucks, and you reach in your pockets and you don't have anything maybe like a penny and you say well this is what I have, um, you're not going to get in that movie right, um, you had that that free ticket that free admission, um, but you decided to throw it away right you didn't believe it you didn't believe it exactly. Um, so Jesus has made that payment for all people, but if we reject it, um, we reject all the blessings that come with it, that, you know, getting to go to heaven, that, that peace with God. Um, so because some people reject it, that's why not everyone goes to heaven. So they end up becoming those people God was descended in hell when he died to save those ones that mocked him and didn't believe him when he was, you know. Okay, yeah, and then, well, when he descended to hell, it, it wasn't to save um, they had they were punished justly for, for their unbelief. Um, you know, God talks about our time on earth. That's the time when we have to get to know him, um, to to hear his gospel. Um, so those people that were in hell, they already had their chance and, and they rejected. That's why they were there. Um, yeah, Jesus down there was saying, just driving home the point, you are here for the right because you rejected me, and I'm showing you that I was right, you were wrong. Um, yeah, so it's a it's a sad reality, but Something we have to rejoice in knowing that we don't have that. And something we also take knowing now, we say, well, I want to do everything I can to make sure other people know this too, that other people believe it, because I don't want them to, to reject it, right? Um, and so finally, um, Christ's payment, that becomes ours through faith. Um, so, so yeah, I'll give you a little context on this passage before I have you read it. Um, Paul and Silas, missionaries, they were traveling around telling people about God's word. Um, and at one place, they were arrested for driving a demon out of, of a girl. Um, this, this guy had this, this demon-possessed girl and was using her to make money. Um, Paul and Silas do the right thing, freed her from that. But the guy's mad at them because, you know, he stole, stole his means of income. And so they're arrested. And 
when they're in that prison, an earthquake comes, opens all of a miraculous earthquake from God, opens all the, the jail cell doors. Um, and the, the prison guard, he wakes up and he sees all the doors are open and he thinks, I'm in a lot of trouble. All these people are escaped now. Um, and so he takes out his sword to, to kill himself because he thinks that's better than whatever punishment is coming. Um, but this is what Paul and Silas say to him. He said, go ahead and read that. He then brought them out and asked, Sir, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in God, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Yeah. So they don't say, Well, you need to do this, this, and this first to be saved. It's as simple as believe in Jesus. Um, that's that's what saves you. Have faith in Jesus, and he he will save you. And so in the next chapter, chapter four, we'll talk about well, how do we get that faith? Um, talking about God working um, the Holy Spirit, that person of the Trinity working that faith in us. So that is chapter three, all about Jesus, mm -hmm. true God, true man, um, his humiliation, exaltation, and his payment, his death, paying for all of our sins. So his death. All right. Any any questions or thoughts mm -hmm. before you finish? That was that was one. Okay. It was dropped. Yeah, yeah, I know it's a lot, so so yeah, but um, no, this stuff it was it was okay, it wasn't, it wasn't overwhelming, okay, yeah. And it's like, like, um, like Pastor always says, you know, if you think of something at home or if you have another question or there's just something that doesn't quite sit right with you, so um, yeah, definitely write it down, bring it back, or you know, type it if you want to text one of us something in the question, yeah, um, yeah, we'd love to, yeah, if anything comes up, we'd love to text you still or answer it, so. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. And right. let's close this morning with prayer then, too. Dear God, um, thank you for teaching us about your Son, our Savior. Um, we know that the punishment for our sins is, is eternal death and hell. But we also know that you sent your Son to pay that price for us. He lived the perfect life in our place. He died on the cross, um, the death we deserve, so that you could give us his righteousness. Um, thank you for sending your Son, both true God and true man, and help us to, to grow in our faith and, and trust in him. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.